Today's guests are Stella Sung. David Cowell. We join their conversation in the Faculty Lounge. It was uh, interesting and, you know, it's, it was fun. I can uh -huh. solve this thing. Oh, yeah. golly, I got a solution. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, me, it was, oh, I can't do this thing. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I can't solve it. Oh. <laughs> but, well, uh, we, we can fix that. Yeah. I can get fixed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> but you see, it's doing things and doing it successfully yeah. that allows a person to get wins. Mm -hmm. You're happy with it. Mm -hmm. And this is some of the basis of uh, making life bearable, enjoyable. And even more interesting is when you can do those things that you like to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, aren't we lucky to yeah. be able to do that? <laughs> Sometimes you have to fight to be able to do it. <laughs> so you were always pretty good at math when you were a kid and, and mm -hmm. able to get up there and do the equations. and. Yeah. That's great. And uh, actually, it was I was in a small high school. What was it? We had about 27 people in our class. And this was in Missouri? Yeah, in Missouri, Missouri. southwest yeah. Missouri. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, there was uh, two of us that were real sharp kids, so mm -hmm. it was him and me that were doing these things. <laughs> <laughs> I bet the rest, rest of the kids were happy. It's like, yeah, they could go up to the board and figure it out. <laughs> yeah. But I was interested in uh, science and physics and engineering, and so when I went to university, I went the engineering physics way mm -hmm. that allowed me then to, uh, you know, either go physics or engineering, depending on which way I wanted after mm -hmm. I got my undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up going uh, theoretical physics for the graduate work. And mm -hmm. then that took me more over into the mathematics. So what's the difference here for, for someone who has no knowledge <laughs> of, of physics and math? All right. We know there's, there, we know that they're, they're, intertwined yeah well let's say physics I would describe that as uh, understanding how things happen in the physical universe oh. and what's going on oh, okay. so you can observe things mm. and then the mathematics deals with okay we have these things happening mm. is there any way that we can do mathematically and figure out how to predict that this will happen mm-hmm now that would be crossing also with theoretical physics. But mathematics in general, mathematics is simply the use of symbols in which to test ideas and relationships. Hmm. That's all it is. Okay. So you devise these symbols <coughs> and you say you got these certain rules of which these symbols are going to operate. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, well now then, this symbol represents this rock, this other symbol will represent something else, and so then hmm. we will then figure out the equations for them and then See how they relate. Or you can simply devise mm -hmm. a mathematics as being nothing more than just simply a collection of symbols and things with no necessary significance to it <laughs> and say, okay, well, you do this with it. And so you got yeah. a game going on. Well, now, it seems to me, and, and I don't really, I really know nothing about math, very little anyways, as, as pertains to the kind of work that you do, which is actually, I'm, I'm curious to know, what is the kind of work that you do specific to to the mathematics or physics or whatever it is that mm -hmm. that is across the pond over at UCF that, that you all do? Well, what we're doing over there at, U uh, at uh, UCF, I actually have a, probably several projects, one of which mm. is more pure mathematics in the sense that, uh, well, you can take a certain type of a water wave mm -hmm. and see as it's moving along, it does certain things. Mm -hmm. Well, you'd like to be able to predict that. I'd like to be able to work out an equation that would tell me just exactly what that's going to do. Mm -hmm. And we've had some of these equations around, but people haven't been able to solve them. Well, you can put them on a computer and crunch, yeah. crunch, <coughs> crunch, and get the numbers out for it. <laughs> but is there a way of doing that just from the start? Yeah. And to be able to say, in general, what's going to be happening for whatever you started with. Mm -hmm. And for some of these systems, you can. And so, it's hmm. a game. How can you manipulate these and 
obtain the relationship. Work. Do you see math, mathematics in when you're walking around? Are you? Do you see math everywhere? You no. know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put that right there. That's no. good. <laughs> I see the universe. You know, uh -huh. I see everything moving, acting, interacting. Mm -hmm. Cars crashing sometimes. You yeah. know, but you know. Yeah. I don't look at it in terms of math. Mm. It's the actual physical universe and mm. the way it's going on. That's right. Well, it's interesting because for musicians, I mean, for, for me as a composer, um, you know, I'm always aware of sound and, and music, not necessarily uh -huh. not necessarily uh, how I'm going to use those music or how, how it, you know, it's just there, and I'm always, I'm always sort of aware of it. Um, so I was wondering, you know, for someone who deals constantly with, with equations and math and sort of thing, do you, you know, you look at your grocery list and you go, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's mathematics. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. no numbers don't, numbers don't uh, translate in those kinds of ways for you or? It's not numbers, <coughs> symbols. Symbols. You're working okay. more with symbols. No, numbers yeah. are in a way symbols. Mm -hmm. And there's certain operations. Fine, mm -hmm. two plus two is equal to four. That's symbol equals symbol equals symbol. Mm -hmm. But then you can attach significance to the symbols. Mm -hmm. And then you then can get results out of them in that uh, you tap two oranges, you put two other oranges with them, and you got four oranges. <laughs> yeah. That's all that is. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of mathematics is basically done just in terms of the symbols. Mm. And so it's just the rules of manipulating symbols. Tic-tac-toe, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting to me because, you know, we, we have quite a lot of, I mean, that's what music is, actually, and in terms of notational mm -hmm. music. It's symbols. You yeah. Know? Um, and you've had experience with music. Your son is a musician and so on, so you know what, when you see the notes on the page, mm -hmm. you know that they're just symbols that relate to some kind of then reproduction of sound. Mm -hmm. And um, which takes me to another tangent about music and sound, and yeah. music and math and sound, mm -hmm. because we know that that sound is sound waves, which are have mathematical uh, equations to them, right? And equivalences. And have you ever studied? Have, have, has that ever taken you your 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 math uh, background? Has that ever taken you into any? explorations of music and, and math at all? Oh, <laughs> as an aside it has, because last mm. semester I was teaching this course, uh, honors course on chaos and complexity. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. Oh, wow, let's and talk about that a little bit. That sounds neat. Yeah, you see, some of the th projects that the students did was they would take uh, these systems that create chaos and ask the mm. question, can we get music out of it? Aha. Uh -huh. And so they would devise various schemes whereby mm -hmm. they could take this chaotic system as it evolves, mm -hmm. and from that, at any given instant, they then could pick out a sound or something, mm -hmm. and they could adjust the intervals and have it all put together and create a music. Now, was this through computer-generated Basically things? through computer-generated, uh -huh. right. So, So when you're talking about chaos, tell me a little bit about what that means in terms of what you're what you're dealing with chaos uh, I mean in these systems generally mean uh, unpredictability in where it's going to be next uh -huh. so so random a, sort of random okay however totally determined uh-huh but if you start from some point you can never tell for sure where it's going to be at the tenth point until you actually go through mm -hmm. because if you change one of these values Mm -hmm. Way down here, just a little month, you get totally a different quantity. It's just extremely sensitive. Hmm. And so, of course, you would slightly change it a little bit, you'd get totally different music. Correct, right. Now, how would the music be generated? Was that through the computer as well? They use <coughs> their own uh, laptops in general to uh, mm -hmm. pick out the values and then mm -hmm. to assign it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's certain programs that will do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with them. Hmm. Is there that that brings to me uh, a question about how then does the content of the course relate to a practical application or a philosophical application? In other words, chaos 
can we create order out of chaos or can chaos create order? <laughs> there is, I mean, yes, yeah. <laughs> and, and you can actually have it going yeah. back and forth. Yeah. You can have a chaotic system, you will find that in a small regime there, mm -hmm. suddenly inside that regime there exists an order. Mm -hmm. Now we look inside that order, we find another smaller area, it's totally chaotic in there. So you get this, it's like cycles within cycles within cycles, you mm. get order, you look mm. in there you find disorder, mm -hmm. you look in there you find, oh, there is this small order. section that's order. Ah. So it's very interesting, it's like you look out across the universe, mm -hmm. it looks to be chaotic. Yeah. But now then, let's just look down on the planet Saturn. The rings are very ordered. Mm -hmm. And now you look down on Saturn itself, it seems to be chaotic, chaotic. all around the mm -hmm. uh, atmosphere there. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it's you different think about scales. It, well, you yeah, know? and then you think <coughs> about it, how can we apply that kind of concept to our lives, you know? and thinking about, well, we have these ups and downs or these places where we have chaos in our lives or we think mm -hmm. there's chaos and then we look at another level and maybe there's actually some order there. So maybe it's always a balancing act between, between uh, order and chaos and they coexist. Well, I would look at it from the point of view, as a person <laughs> goes through life, he's like, say, a single individual. Mm -hmm. He's going to hit these various areas. Mm -hmm. and there could be areas where the things are in order. Mm -hmm. And then the, you hit areas where that, uh, if he hits some suppression or something mm -hmm. which is trying to give him difficulty and problems that he can't handle, then mm. things go into disorder. Mm -hmm. If he can then handle it, things yeah. can straighten out into order. So there is an analogy <laughs> there, there like Absolutely. <laughs> I guess there is. Now with, uh, with teaching uh, mathematics, how, how do you find that? to be? In other words, do you have students who you, you instantly say, aha, that's a mathematician, that's going to be, and then, then you have some students say, mm, no, no, they, they're just taking this class because they have to or something like that. I mean, do you, is, is there such a thing as, as talent in mathematics? As, for example, it, as we see in music. There's an interest in mathematics. Just like mm. you were interested in music, right? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. right. Did your parents make you be a musician? Well, they may be practice. <laughs> and put a little, well, you know, but no. Were you willing to practice? Ultimately, ultimately, yes. I mean, okay. uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. I knew that that was what I wanted to do at a pretty early age. I didn't always know I was going to be a composer, however. So, and okay. that was a different exploration. But, um, but, but, yeah. I think so. So, I think that there there must be then some aspect of when someone comes to you and says, "I want to be a mathematician." That's the first step. Does he want to be? Mm -hmm. If the person doesn't want to be, mm. even when he is studying, yeah. if he really doesn't want to have that subject, mm -hmm. he's going to be difficult to teach. Mm -hmm. He's going to have problems learning it. The one thing that uh, would help any student to learn something is to look at the subject and ask, okay, how can I use this in my career in the future? What is it I want to do with it? Right. Somebody can study mm -hmm. French, not planning to use it ever at all. Mm -hmm. And when they finish the course, okay, what they got out of it? Yeah. Well, right. Maybe a little exactly. bit of understanding of some French Couple words or something like that, and that's <laughs> it. But then somebody that wants to go to France for six months, yeah, he's going to study it, mm -hmm. and he's going to get something out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing you need is an interest. Mm -hmm. If the person has that interest, then it's possible to teach him the material. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he's simply taking the exam. Exactly. He crams exactly. for it. Maybe he gets the grade he wants. Maybe he doesn't. Have you ever run across a, a, a student with, with that kind of great um, interest or passion? And, I, and maybe this is the interesting thing is we, we think about our fields, all the, the different fields that we have at, at the university and so on. And maybe the ultimate thing that has kept each of us, has taken us to the position of professor of mathematics, mm -hmm. professor of music, is that we've, ha we've had this passion for what we do. And it doesn't matter, as you say, the interest. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's music or math. It's, it's the well, what, desire. What's the difference between interest and passion? 
Well, I think maybe passion might be a little bit deeper level. I don't know, but I think you have to have the interest. If you don't have yes. the interest, uh, you know, then you can't have the passion. And, and I think maybe the passion is that is the further driving force, or the or the or the the thing that yeah. pushes you to the to, to staying up okay. until four o'clock in the morning to try to figure out what that answer is to that equation. I, I would you know? consider that to also be in terms of interest too. True. But at the moment I don't have a word that describes it. Passion doesn't seem to be there. It does describe Maybe. it. It does describe yeah. it. Yeah. But, uh, so when you're in the midst of figuring out, you know, a complex yeah. problem or a simple problem that looks complex or whatever. Oh, those simple <laughs> problems. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, well, now here's the thing, for example, yeah. yeah, because the simplicity, isn't there something inherently interesting in the simplicity of mathematics? Yes, because you will run across these systems that as you start working with them, they sort of come back on themselves and you ask yourself, how can they get related back like yeah, this? Yeah. There is some deeper significance there that yeah. if you can get a handle on and understand and explain, it then expands out and allows you to understand something more general. You see, you're amazing? finding a more general truth, right? a more potent truth. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, you then can increase your understanding. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like when you grab hold of one of those and you look at it and you say, wow. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's, it's just, that's the incredible thing about, about yeah. uh, but see, the exploration. That's, cr that's yeah. creativity at uh -huh. work. Yeah. Because you could have all that data there. Yeah. But until you take that data and compare it and organize it and actually are able to associate it, mm -hmm. this is something no computers can do. There you go. It takes there a person, mm -hmm. an individual. Computers can easily there calculate and crunch, mm -hmm. but actually it's they the can't think. Yeah, right, right. As we think. Right. They just don't. But it's that creativity <coughs> which makes the difference there. That is the that is the amazing thing about all of this is <laughs> is that we have this common uh, goal or common bond of creativity and yeah. we don't sometimes we don't think about you know the mathematician being creative we think of the artists being cre creative you right. know, it's always that's the thing we're always creative people but but mathematics you're you're, you're creative too in a, in a very mm -hmm. interesting and and very um, global way I don't think most people appreciate that some yeah. of the mathematicians I don't think they really appreciate you know just what it is is that it is creating mm -hmm. because if you don't have this area of mathematics, well, somebody had to put it there. Right. Somebody right. had to be able to work it out and to describe it and to put it into a way that others can understand it. Mm -hmm. It's like a painter. He's putting the brush marks across this, and he's putting them across there so when somebody looks at it, they see what exactly. he wants them to see. Right, right. Whereas an artist could perhaps create anything he wants to. Mm -hmm. Mathematics depends on the rules that you got to, to play with. It's a little more constrained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless you go out and develop a new mathematics mm. and then, but even then if you have rules in it, they got to be self-consistent mm -hmm. or the thing won't mm -hmm. work. But you know, actually I sometimes think even even with the, the artist, the, the, per, the person or the, the composer for example, you know, I can put any number of notes anywhere I want to, but Still, I think in order for them to work, at least I hope in, in the music that I write, that they work because there's some structure there, that there were, there, there's some underlying foundational there's, structure. There's you know, a, the rules uh, are still there, you yeah. know, just a little bit kind of flex, flexed yeah. out a little bit, but, but they're still there. So in the same way that you might True. be dealing with certain formula or so, uh, the foundation is there, but you expand out of the box to, to find other ways to make that um, mm -hmm. more interesting or exciting or creative or, mm -hmm. or find some other avenue for those things to work. Yeah. But now then, yeah. what are these rules in composing, you know, in terms yeah. of what note is that next one should <laughs> yeah. that be, you know? But yeah. actually, you're not working with notes, you're working with more of a general 
area yeah. and then inside of what you're putting the notes. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's how I, I tend to work. I don't know, some people may not work that way, but, but I tend to find a larger structure, a larger yeah. picture. Uh, and in a way, I sort of see sections of things. You know, I, mm -hmm. I look at sections of things and how to get from point A to point B mm -hmm. and the things that need to be filled in in between those things. Now, they can take any number of routes um, going that way, but, uh, but underneath it all is, is the sort of idea that I need to get from point A to point B, you know, and, and figure out how to get from B to C and then now, the end. what are those rules? Well, you know, it's interesting because we work within this realm of, of uh, Western notation and right. Western musical scale. So um, out within, those, within that uh, structure, the, the notes and the pitches are pretty much set. Now, this is why I think it's very interesting for people now to explore music that, are, that is not that is not Western traditional based mm -hmm. because they have different notation skills, they have different uh, types of music and sounds, not necessarily at all that we would even relate to. So the structure is basically, that I work with right now anyway, is, is that which is in, in within this sort of Western musical tradition. Mm -hmm. So s set scales, uh, set sort of rhythmic kinds of devices. Um, we're still always liking to, looking for, for ways to expand those things. But now and then, you've written a few notes there, and you've got to write the next note. Yeah. What is it that determines what that <laughs> next note should be? <laughs> that is the big question, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what's the next number, you know? Uh, <laughs> well, I, you know, I think it's, it's uh, that is probably the hardest question to answer okay. in terms of what comes next. But, but uh, there's always this exploration, you know? And I think it's sort of, we go a little bit on what feels right mm -hmm. to, to me as a composer, what, what I think should go next. And also, sometimes it's determined by what uh, is going to be ahead, or what I mm -hmm. imagine to be ahead of the thing. So if I'm, let's say I'm, I'm trying to build a phrase to a, a big climax of some sort. All right, I need to determine what notes can be chosen that will get me to that next big place. And so there are certain types of tones maybe that I'll make a decision about, well, I don't want to go down, I want to go up, you know, mm -hmm. the, the scale to make that heightened uh, kind of uh, feeling that I want to get from the, from the music. Okay. So it's, some t it's, it's, it's an exploration, you know, and um, Perhaps it is the same, I don't know, but perhaps it is the same when you're working on something in abstract math where you're trying to decide, well, what comes next? What part of this equation comes next mm -hmm. in order to find the answer? Mm -hmm. uh, um, but there's, you're looking at it from the point of view, okay, how's it going to sound, you know? Yeah. Is it going to sound and create this type of an effect? Mm -hmm. How does one determine that? Yeah, it's pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's yeah. a hard, and that is it's what is the hardest thing, you know, to teach. That's it, right? right? I mean, it's a, it's, and, and and this is maybe something that you find also when you're working with your students is you, oh, yeah. how do you teach? You can't, you know, can you can you teach someone to think of what of of how to choose that next thing, you know? And and it's very hard. I mean, I think. Uh, you know, I never tell my students, you must write in this particular way or, you know, you've got to compose like this and, and they bring me their work and I say, I never say to them, well, you know, you, not need, you have to put that note there next because it's not my sense, you mm -hmm. know. But uh, it's the kind of thing, I guess, that that's what makes all of us different. You know, we're going to choose different things. We're going to, we're going to, to hear different notes in, in our realm. Now what you can teach is for a person to to look at choices and to think about the different types of choices. The process. I don't know, maybe that's do you teach process? You know, do you do you Yeah. We have certain procedures whereby if we have a certain system and we want to 
do something to it in order to obtain some simpler result, mm -hmm. there are certain procedures that one can do mm -hmm. that are laid out. Uh, they work in general, mm. but sometimes you can devise a system which is a little bit different so it doesn't exactly follow those rules. Mm -hmm. And it gives the student a challenge, you know, to figure out how to do it. <laughs> That's a challenge is good. <laughs> challenge is good. But uh, there are s certain general approaches, you know, that works very nicely in terms of uh, simplifying systems. Uh -huh. This gets into also, we're starting to get a little bit into modeling. Ah, okay. Because... Tell me a little bit about that. If you wanted to build a device that's useful, mm -hmm. you want to be able to have it controllable. Mm -hmm. So okay. to have something controllable, you want to be able to, say, push a level or two, mm -hmm. or turn a wheel or something like that, and have it go that way. For example, an airplane. Mm -hmm. You want to fly it, you want to be able to do it with your pedals and with your uh, wheel or whatever you yeah. have. But now then, if there's all sorts of variables that could possibly change, mm -hmm. then the plane may not be flyable. That's true. You see? <laughs> I can see. That I can relate to, yes. As you get more and more <laughs> possible degrees of freedom or ways in which it could twist or flap. Yeah. You know, you just take a regular airplane, now let's just put a couple of extra flaps on it here mm -hmm. and there, you know, not let the pilot <laughs> control them, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> See where that goes. <laughs> so if you want a useful system, it has to have few variables. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get a system down to a few variables, mm -hmm. it becomes also possible to model it mathematically. Mm -hmm. The more complexity it has, the more difficult it is to model. Some of those systems may be mm -hmm. in interesting mathematically. Mm -hmm. However, the possibility of it being useful and of interest mm -hmm. in physics and engineering and like that becomes even more remote. Mm -hmm. So there's this general principle in modeling is you want to reduce the system to as few variables as possible so that you can uh, utilize it or make huh. use of it.